Welcome everyone. I think I'm live. At least it says I'm live, so it should be the case. I have now officially opened enrollment for my German Idealism Masterclass 2022, which will begin, if you join the seminars at least, on Saturday, June 18th. We already have about 10 people enrolled who um, reached out earlier and enrolled early, but I'm going to introduce the course now to anyone who stumbles upon this. And if you have any questions on the course or on German idealism, then just let me know in the chat and I will respond. If you know anyone who is interested in Kant, in Fichte, in Schelling, in Hegel, in Hölderlin, or any of the thinkers and schools that come after German idealism and are influenced by it, then just share the link with them right now. So we have a bit more people listening who may not yet have subscribed to the channel. I'd like to begin with perhaps a bit of an overview of the time of or the epoch of German idealism. It's roughly from, you know, spans a time from 1781 to 1821. So let's say it's 40 years or so. And in these 40 years, what we now call German idealism, which is not to do with abstract, another world, idealism, ghost physics, or any of the sort, is the richest, most condensed, wealthiest time in all of philosophy. There has never been before, and certainly not after, any other period except, of course, for the Greek time when philosophy came to be, but this was stretched across centuries and across regions. What happens in Germany at this time is absolutely incredible. Fichte writes in a letter to Reinhold, die Geistesfunken sprühen, so the spirit is emanating sparks. That's a rough uh, translation of it. It's not as beautiful as the German the Geistesfunken sprühen, you probably it's impossible to say in English because there's no word for Geistesfunken, is there? And when we say spirit in English, it means something else a bit. So still, this this moment in in time in history for, for Hegel, for Schelling, it seemed to be that finally a new world was on the horizon. Truth was coming. The day of truth was near. It was nearly eschatological. And when Schelling gets old, he was he lived the longest of all of them. He looks back on this time and is well a bit flabbergasted about what seemed possible. In his, I look at it right now in his uh, lecture series given at the Academy of Munich on university studies. He says that the new world is about to come. Hegel says something very similar in the preface to the phenomenology of spirit. And in this lecture series on university studies, Schelling also says that the following, which is the leitmotiv of the course, learn only in order to create. Mechanical memorization is not learning. And this is also what I propagate in my courses and, and especially in this course, of course. So maybe a bit briefly, if you're completely new to this channel and maybe you haven't subscribed yet or so, my name is Johannes Niederhauser. I have a PhD in philosophy. I finished my studies on Heidegger in 2018. I've published several papers on Heidegger and, and other thinkers and also one on he Heidegger's notes, a review of Heidegger's notes of Hegel's negativity with the Hegel Bulletin. I've studied Hegel under Stephen Holgate at Warwick and with Max Gottschlich in Vienna. And, well, I am a German, as you can probably tell. So there's a bit of a background there, too, when it comes to the language and this way of thinking that is a bit foreign, let's say, to uh, the Anglophone world, especially because it's very much about innerness. And that begins with Master Eckhart is radicalized more by Luther but the, whereas the Aufklärung, the Enlightenment in Scotland is, well, to do with controlling the passions or so. And 
uh, in in France, it's it's about a very mathematical uh, rationality. In the German spirit, it is it comes out of the innerness of of truth. And what we can see with German idealism is the really the, the radically first attempt, and also I think attainment of a marriage of the the lost ancient spirit of seeing nature and man's place within it in all its glory and trying to marry this with the scientific new world without turning nature into a machine. Of course, we will be therefore also consider the place of nature and the place of the human being in it and its relationship with spirit. So maybe there's another quote actually I'd like to to read briefly. Fichte is buried in Berlin next to his wife and on his wife's uh, tombstone, Johanna Marie Fichte, it says in German, die edelste Trauer um die Toten ist wandeln in ihrer Bahn ihrem Vorbilde nach. So the most noble grief for the dead means to follow them um, or to walk along their path and to follow their image, to follow their example. So that's what we shall try to do. Of course, with Hegel there is a great completion that occurs of speculative reason. There can be nothing higher than Hegel, which is why in this course we consider the path from Kant to Hegel. Um, that's not to say that after Hegel thinking collapses, which it does to, to a large degree, and that it is impossible to um, revive it. Well, in a sense, what we're not trying to do is have some sort of an epigonal renaissance or so. But we do want to understand why there was such an incredible access to the mystery of what it means to be human and the divine in this period. So, not to have an epigonal renaissance of it, and not to uh, fantasize here at the edge of the end of history, um, <laughs> what it would what it would have been like in the 19th century and before, but instead to, well, to salvage from the wreckage what is worthy of the being delivered over into the new age and also to firm, to, to make firm um, the, the, the place of uh, the human being and to show the limitations of uh, the, the fancies of the imagination today, right, which deems itself um, at the crossroad where the human being is to be replaced by machines not in the sense that machines replace the human being and, and you know doing the work but but literally robots or cyborgs or whatever taking over and, and making the human being utterly and completely obsolete uh, which these are fantasies these are dreams these they make you know they're, they're pipe dreams ultimately um, but they're telling uh, where the human, what the human being thinks of himself at this point, and it's remarkably sad. Of course, it's also a remarkably uh, American uh, fantasy. Um, it's not um, particularly European, so we are here upholding the European spirit against the encroaching Americanism. And this, uh, you are invited to join the course and to begin to learn how to think and to learn in order to create, as Schelling said. So we, <laughs> it's always interesting to see when, when people drop out and when people come in, maybe someone just felt a bit, uh, uh, felt a bit hurt by what I said. And I don't apologize, of course. So enrollment is now open. There's a link in the description of this uh, video where you can enroll. And if you do, then you are taken to, when you follow that link, you're taken to a website called Teachable. And that website is where the 
course is hosted. So you get access to six video lectures and also uh, so video lectures that are exclusive. They won't be published on YouTube or anywhere else. There's also audio files of that and you can also read um, the lecture notes. You get a little book with it as well. You can print off and well then so let me maybe briefly explain how the whole course uh, works because sometimes that's a bit uh, too abstract for people and we do want to be concrete here the three different they call it tiers that you can choose from the first one is self-study you sign up now you have access to all study materials or course materials for as long as you want and you can study at your own pace so if you want to do everything in a week, you can do it in a week. If you want to do everything in, in two years, you can do it over two years. And you can always come back to the course content. And you also get anything that I add to the course over the next years, you will have access to that. So I taught this course last year. I teach this course again this year. Everyone who was on the course last year will get access to the newly recorded videos. So I'm rewriting the lectures for this one so you can get access to the um you have access to so anyone who's in the course last year has access to the new videos as well that's the same that happens for you and the middle tier is the one where you can well join me in live group seminars where we have group discussions on the text there's seven seminars six lectures but seven seminars on seven consecutive saturdays except for actually the last saturday is a bit of a break in between but the final seminar is where you can then present your own work and we can publish that on youtube we don't have to but this is a chance for you to write something and also during this time of the course you're invited to submit two short essays of about 500 to 750 words each on a study question that I give you. And so, so there are several study questions you can choose from to, to try and write a very short, succinct essay on some of the problems and questions. And once you, when you submit that, I give you, I don't give you a mark, I don't give you feedback, I, I re reject the cybernetic language, but I will comment <laughs> in the old sense of the word. I will think with your essay, which means attempt in French, and you can. Uh, then work with what the comments I've given you, maybe some directions of where you could go with the, your your um, your writing. So this is, you know, I, I want to make sure that if you want to write, there's enough space and time for you to explore writing and to get better at it. The third tier, of which there are only two um, left now, you can there's everything of the lower tiers including six private seminars with me that means we meet over zoom privately one-on-one -on -one, as they say and we discuss the readings or maybe your writings or so in more detail and if you have for example specific questions on kant or Hegel or so, we can go over them, or we can just go over the seminars and lectures again in more detail, or something else that comes up for you that you're currently reading that is related to this epoch. So I will now give an overview of the course itself. And you can enroll, maybe I should do this now, you can enroll via this link, yeah? And there are two different, uh, for anyone who's, who's signing up now, there are two coupons, as they call them. So I will just uh, put this in here off the chat. By the way, if you have any questions on the course or on Trevor Idealism, please let me know now so I can respond to them at the end of the stream. So you can use these coupons and enroll now and get a hundred dollars off the the seminar tier or four hundred dollars off the 
um, the dialogue tier, which is private tutorials with me. So in the course, what we are going to cover is, well, are the following thinkers. Kant, Fichte, Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel. Kant is the beginning of the period that we now call German idealism. We will focus almost exclusively on the first critique. That's enough to, to handle for, for that for, of, when it comes to Kant. We, I read Kant in a very specific way, which is unusual and certainly unheard of in the Anglophone sphere, where Kant, especially the first critique, is usually thought of as an epistemologist. But what Kant really in, shows or breaches into is the transcendental realm of a complete, and so transcendental, by the way, does not mean anything transcending. People, there's a lot of confusion around that term. Transcendental means something very specific. Namely, the a priori necessary conditions for experience. And Kant sets the, them up so that the categories, the concept of the understanding, do apply a priori to spatio-temporal content. So we will make sure that you understand how Kant responds to rationalism and empiricism, both of which have led reason astray. As he says, human reason has a peculiar fate in one species of its cognitions, that it is burdened with questions which it cannot dismiss, but which it has to respond to. At the same time, he says, metaphysics, this is the first page of the critique, Metaphysics has become a battlefield, and that battlefield he wants to pacify <laughs> um, with his critical philosophy. And so we will look at, because with Hume, what happens with Hume is a proto-nihilism shows itself. There's a collapse of the unity of being and thought, or you could also say there's a man falls out of nature, out of the regularity of the cosmos. So it's basically what Hume leaves us with is not just some, you know, quaint uh, skepticism. I don't know whether the sun will rise tomorrow. It's it's a proto nihilism, and in fact, a nihilism that could lead to solipsism, to an incomplete closeness of the human being within himself, and to uh, well, that sense a complete collapse of of meaning. So what Kant tries to do, and we'll talk more about the dogmatic metaphysics at, at the course, I won't discuss this here, that's even more important than Hume, I think, to Kant. What Kant does, though, is, is, is marry again the logical form of the I think to spatial temporal experience. When we get to, oh, and of course, there remain a poriot. There are two lectures on Kant. And Fichte begins to see these wounds, these weak spots in Kant. And he tries to solve for them by relocating the dialectic that Kant wants to avoid but runs into. Fichte relocates them into the, the self-positing eye, the eye that posits itself. So it's quite... Um, uh, important to understand why Fichte uh, does this, and and why though it, it it there's a limitation also to to this way of thinking. So uh, again, I said with 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 Kant, there's a uh, what Kant does is through beginning to posit or suppose necessary conditions that make experience possible. What Fichte does is relocating the struggle between the phenomenal and the noumenal into the always striving I. At the same time, this has a severe threat to it that Fichte is aware of, which is that nature is reduced to a, a fiction. But that, that's not what Fichte wants, but that is what could be one of the consequences of the thought. And once we get to the, what I think of as the, the three main thinkers of German idealism, Hölderlin, Fichte, uh, sorry, Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel, 
we are firmly with the attempt to articulate nature and man and spirit in such a way that they each retain their essence, but also find a place within each other. So we will read Herdelin's essays on the poetical ego and on the harmony of counter positions. We will read Schelling, Schelling's treatise on the essence of human freedom and his notion of evil. We will also read excerpts from his book or lecture series on university studies. We will also then read, of course, Hegel, and especially the science of logic. So we will see why in Hegel there is the highest fulfillment or completion of not just this way of thinking, but really of Western metaphysics. So if you have any questions, let me know, please so that I can answer them before I disappear again into the night. As I've mentioned before, the course starts uh, on June 18th. That's the live seminars, the group seminars over Zoom, where, okay, maybe I should talk a bit about what happens during these seminars. It depends on how many people sign up. Sometimes it's it's 10, sometimes it's, it's 40 people. And... We usually have, I lead the seminars, there's no TA, I lead the seminars and I introduce the topics that you will come prepared, you've done some of the reading, you will have listened to my lecture. And I introduce the topic again for about 10-15 minutes or so. After that, usually depending on group size, I send you off into breakout sessions, two to three people, so you can discuss some of the questions and your own reading of it. I bring you back, and then the second hour is spent on, well, as a, as a group discussion, uh, a big forum where you can ask me questions to uh, clarify anything, any issues that you have or so. And of course, also during the course, I'm available for your questions over email. And with that middle tier, that the, the link is up there, how you can enroll to them um, in that one, that middle tier gives you also the opportunity to write essays. So you will be prompted or you know asked to write something within the first two weeks and then again after the fifth week or so. And in the final seminar, building on what you've written, you can present a talk. That's how we always end the course, the pro seminar, is where you present a talk that's 10 minutes or so long, depending on how many people uh, want to give a talk. Usually it's about, it's almost, depending on, in my course is usually almost everyone. By the way, so maybe I should also say this, if when you enroll, it's one of the best ways of supporting my work here. So as you know, if you're a subscriber to the channel, then um, I publish quite a bit. And I know from the emails that I receive that the videos are insightful and helpful to many. But it's only made possible as long as there are people enrolling in the courses or maybe sending uh, some uh, contribution over PayPal or Patreon, etc. Because I don't have an academic position and I'm not really looking for one, to be honest. So I'd like to be uh, free. I do think that there is something uh, peculiar about academia today, um, where I don't think universities don't really talk about education anymore, do they? They, they call it student experience or so. It's quite remarkably ridiculous. So, but overall, uh, to come back to the topic. Let me say this again. Last year, one of the reviews I got was someone said to me that he was very grateful for the course because he was able to 
well, you know, these the sort of the big names, let's say, of of philosophy, big names as, such as Kant and, and Hegel, they become more accessible. I don't claim you walk away being you know, an expert in German idealism or having understood everything um, absolutely and perfectly. That's not what an introductory course can do. It's, but it what it will do is it will grant you an access to this this period and these thinkers, so that you are you have less of a false respect for these big names and actually can take it on to read the text directly, which is also why we will mostly just read what they now call the primary sources and not commentary. So there is commentary, uh, which are my lectures, but there is especially what's really important is that we read the primary sources together and try and make sense of them. And what you will see during the seminars is that they are, they couldn't be further from what I think, um, some well university seminars can be like or so uh so some of the comments i usually often get is this is what university should be like or could be like <laughs> um and or should have been like as someone said last year also i think the reason for that is these are very generative and 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 spontaneous gatherings that uh, while there is a set text, and while we do want to make sense of Kant, we do also we do also tie it in with our time. And there's a video on my channel, which you may be able to find, which I think has the title "Kant: um, How How Kant's Philosophy Lets Us Fly Airplanes." And this is not an exaggeration. There's a reason. So, if you think of Kant as an epistemologist, I think you're going to be missing out on some of the fundamentals. What really, and this is very succinctly put now, but still, I think what really happens is with, with Kant, we burst into a an understanding of space and through a certain logic that um, lets uh, the human mind control the phenomenal sphere through positing all the necessary conditions a priori, that's what transcendental means, so that the kerosene always reacts in the same way as it has been supposed. So you have to think in the reverse. It's not the experiment that comes first. It's the logic that comes before the experiment. We will also consider in the lecture, one of the lectures I've written, um, I mentioned the Higgs particle at CERN and what that has to do with transcendental idealism. And, you know, there aren't that many experiment, uh, experiential uh, values for spaceships, are there, when you build the first one? So while, of course, there's a, there's a bit of a feedback between then the empirical, realistic experiment and the improvement, the further improvement of the space rocket or spaceship, etc., there is still what always comes before is the drawing up and the setting up and the setting upon of necessary conditions a priori that determine the objectivity of objects in the way in which they are supposed to show themselves. While, of course, what things are in themselves, this natural resistance of things in themselves, is pushed into the lim liminal space of the noumenal, as Kant calls it. So what we lose with Kant is an access to the essence of nature. And this is what Herdelin and Schelling and Hegel will all try to get back to, is to try and articulate again what it means to be in nature and with nature, and without reducing it to, as, as Descartes would have done, to a machine or so, 
or also with Kant to 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 abstract laws. So please do let me know if you have questions specifically either on any of the thinkers that we'll discuss, so Kant, Fichte, Hölderlin, Schelling, and Hegel, you just ask now in the chat and I'll respond. Or if you have a question on what the course will be like, I'm very happy to respond. Now, I know there's always a bit of a delay. Uh, I don't know how long the delay is between me saying this and and you hearing this, I have to wait for a, a bit. So I know that um, you are uh, here and that I, I can respond to your question. And, I, if I, and if I can, I will. As you also get a bit of a sense of what the, what the seminars are like, ultimately. Um, if, however, if, hmm, what do I want to say? I think I forgot. Um, but that doesn't matter. I think I just saw that someone just enrolled, which is very nice. Thank you very much for that. The link to enroll is here in the live chat. Um, the link is also in the video. If you know anyone who is interested in German idealism, then you should perhaps tell them so they can watch this video even after the live stream. The maybe also I mentioned this German idealism, you know, I don't want to announce it as saying it's important because it's influenced this, that, and the other. Um, it, it um, but what, what, it, it, if you're interested in Marx or in 20th century phenomenology, in accelerationism, you could say also, um, Deleuze, Derrida, Heidegger, Sartre, all of these thinkers make little to no sense if you don't have a firm grounding in German ideas. So we're not touching upon, so we're not, we're not considering Marx or Marxism. We're not, we won't consider accelerationism, etc. But I think when you come to the course, you will better understand what it is that some of these isms mean and what they themselves respond to and why, for example, phenomenology becomes necessary. So here's a question from Andrew Luber. In your opinion, philosophers don't have opinion, Mr. Luber, I do apologize, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, in your opinion, who's more of a penetrating philosopher, Hegel or Heidegger? Well, it depends what you mean by penetrating, I suppose. So, all right. Well, you see, so... <sighs> So it's not, there's not about, this is not, so it's not about taste or, or I like this guy more. No, no. So the, the, the question is this, Heidegger and Hegel respond to the same in a different manner and the necessity for why they respond in a different manner. That's what's the, that's what, that's, that's the question. The question is not who's better, but the question is, why is Heidegger's thinking necessary after Hegel? Why is phenomenology becoming necessary after this completion of speculative, objective uh, reason and metaphysics in the of the Occident? And this is what Heidegger responds to. For Heidegger, the great fire has been extinguished. The question for Heidegger becomes one of another beginning. How, what can we salvage from the wreckage? And what can we deliver and have to deliver over from the tradition so that not all is lost in oblivion? Um, but now on a more, say, abstract, or so this is a bit of a, you could say, a historical. I don't want to historicize this all in the past, but a geschichtlich, a situational uh, um, uh, response. But if you maybe move in a more abstract um th th their projects aren't aren't that different they they both begin to see hegel before heidegger of course but begin to see the necessity for for what hegel calls a presuppositionless uh, thinking and for heidegger to return to the origin hegel is also about and by the way also hölderlin is about an attempt to return it's a good question by the way so uh, uh 
is a, the attempt is to move to the origin, but for Hegel, it cannot be a, it cannot be presupposed, as he says in the beginning of the logic. We are as we are moving further in the logic, we are moving also further to the. We are uncovering as the logic unfolds. I think what Heidegger would say about Hegel is that though, even though here nothingness or the nothing or negativity finally becomes central in Western thought, it still is not taken seriously enough. There's no sudden catastrophe possible, no sudden catast catastrophe, catastrophe in Greek means um, a sudden overturning possible. And Heidegger will radicalize the negativity of history and the negativity of being, and I'm speaking a non-Heideggerian way now, um, even more than Hegel. But these are, so this is a very good question, uh, these are exactly the kinds of questions, of course, that we discuss also during the seminars. And by the way, if this is something that then you, Andrew, or so would like to pursue further if you sign up for the course, then this is something you can write about, you know, during the course and then also present your final uh, talk on. Um, where does Heidegger stand with regards to Hegel? But I, what I want to avoid, though, are these superficial external assessments of thinkers. Like, I like this about Kant. I don't like this about Hegel. That's that's not philosophy. That's nonsense. You know, D don't do that. There's 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 necessity to thinking. There are limitations to certain. You know, and it's not just pick and choose. Thinking sometimes ends, and then there are centuries when no one thinks at all. And hence, perhaps, after Hegel, why does phenomenology become necessary? There's necessity to it. It's not arbitrary. It's not because, I mean, today everything is arbitrary. That's obvious, right? Because today you have, in academia, you have the, any, any trend that, that will give you a paycheck. You know, that, that, that's, that's what's... Now we do new realism. It's called new. Because... Well, this is how you fill in the forms to get funding. Or, I mean, after new realism, obviously, just to say that the absolute obvious was going to come is a new skepticism, right? Uh, I mean, I've been saying this for years now, but if anyone wants to do this, I'd be, I'd, it'd, it'd be such a ludicrous, hilarious um, uh, performance um, piece to actually uh, initiate the new skepticism movement and just pull out some funds from the acad acad academic uh, landscape uh, for that, and then tell them after five years, by the way, it was all just a big, was just a big joke. So you can see now it has become arbitrary. It's just new isms after new isms. But when you take thinking seriously, then you see the aporias in some thinkers. As Fichte see sees in Kant, hence he has to respond in a certain way. And as he responds in a certain way, Schelling, who is his student, already also sees the very, very limitations of transcendental philosophy itself, which we won't go into here, but we will go into at the course, which is just, as a side note, is the radical finitude, um, the radical finitude of, <laughs> of, ex, uh, of, 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 um, of the human mind. It's just read Mr. Luba's uh, response. So yeah, thank you as well for the excellent question. Um, and uh, so they see, again, that we need to take the absolute seriously. We cannot just abandon the absolute or the idea, the ideal of reason to the transcendent realm and, and claim that it's not there. It was there, and it had to be articulated. It was waiting for it. So, uh, again, um, if... if uh, you know, so, so the only thing perhaps that one can learn from from me <laughs> is is that this is it's not arbitrary. Not none of this is arbitrary. Thinking thinks itself. We participate in it, and we are we have the task to take it seriously and to carry it on. And 
there, there's a bit of a you know if there's arbitrariness of of these all these new isms or so sorry um th that's something really to be very very worried about but it says something about philosophy itself namely that philosophy really might be at a dead end uh and as it is at a, at a dead end um the question of course becomes what is it that we can um that we can do to as philosophers or, or people who read philosophy but i think what we can do is is to begin to understand in how far thinking opens up certain realms of possibilities in which we then live and that's what we'll see i think in the course so andrew luber i hope you sign up um and if there are more questions, please let me know now. If not, then I shall retire and disappear. The link to enroll, I'll say it again, is this one here. There are two coupons. Um, if you use this coupon here, yeah, so again, if you have questions, let me know now. Um, so do enroll. If you know anyone who's interested in German idealism, let them know and enroll uh, and let them know that they can um, enroll in a course. Again, if anyone who's interested in Marx, accelerationism, so, you know, Nick Land is a ghost who, uh, who's, 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 uh, whose theories are all over the internet, um, then do, uh, you know, uh, you, you need to understand what it is that Kant is on about and Hegel and in, and uh, to make to be able to make sense of what they're saying and actually to assess whether or not uh, what what someone like Nick Land says is actually you know true. Uh, by the way, I'm going to make at some point a video about <clears throat> some of the claims that that Nick Land uh, has made and uh, to show the limitations of them and also how you know you can if you know a little bit just a little bit about metaphysics and you do away with all the shenanigans and all the the, the horror language, etc. there's not much there. And to say, for example, that, oh, Kant, you know, Kant is right, and no one else has overcome him. Th that's such, again, that's arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. This is not what thinking is. Uh, this is not how thinking unfolds. It's not about this you know leibniz was right everyone else was wrong okay but why, so but so why don't we all stop at leibniz then weird right well if kant was right then why did fichte become necessary only a few years after kant you see this makes almost no sense to say something like this. So there will be a video on this. But anyways, you 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 need to have a grounding in terms of idealism to understand even that stuff. Uh, phenomenology, Husserl, and especially Heidegger, uh, Deleuze, Derrida, Sartre, uh, Nietzsche. You could say we're all uh, influenced. Um, and yeah, so that question by Andrew. Another question: What grounds these responses to the same thing? Very good. I won't answer that now. That's the book I'm writing at the moment, um, which is handwritten <laughs> and unpublishable. So uh, in my unpublishable handwritten book, which hopefully is will be finished at some point after this summer, um, I will be able to answer that. I mean, I, I can answer it now, but I won't. But it's a good question. There's someone here who thinks philosophically, you see. Um, so I do hope, Mr. Luber, that you do sign up and everybody else also who's listening tonight and everyone who didn't ask a question. If you come to this later and you have a question later on, please don't hesitate, just comment. I usually respond. And yeah, thank you very much indeed. Enrollment is open. I see you all in, what, 17 days from now on the first occasion of the live seminars. So long. And as Schelling said, learn only in order to create. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Good night.
I shall retire.